All right, welcome back to Dinosaurs. We talked last time about the syllabus, so I introduced kind of how the class works and where to find stuff. And if you're still confused about that, just go check on Blackboard, go to the course information tab. You'll find the syllabus, you'll find the course schedule. And in the content area, you'll find all the lectures, all these videos. Although if you're watching this video, you already know that. So I don't have to tell you, go tell all the other people. Uh, but anyways, uh, today we're going to talk about what is a dinosaur. So this class is dinosaurs. Remember the exclamation point. What is a dinosaur? That seems like a pretty important topic to discuss in dinosaur class. But before we do that, let's do a couple announcements. So uh, any questions? Nope, I'm not hearing anything. So I will move along. So what is a dinosaur? What is a dinosaur exclamation point? So dinosaur, the literal translation is dinos, it's Greek, it means fearfully great. Uh, it's often translated to be terrible, so that it translates to Soros being wizard. Sometimes people translate it as terrible lizard. Uh, and that wasn't the original intention. The original intention was dinos meaning fearfully great, like so big that it's scary, like they're scary big. So fearfully great, lizards, uh, or maybe even not lizards, but reptiles, fearfully great reptiles. Uh, they appeared in the late Triassic somewhere around 230 million years ago. That date keeps getting slid back a little bit. Some people might say 240 million years ago now, but sometime in the late Triassic. And they evolved from ancestors that were around in the Permian. And where do you draw that line? Uh, generally, it's drawn in the, very, in the, in the Triassic. Uh, the earliest dinosaurs were mostly small, so about a meter. So if you look on this timeline here, here's the Triassic period, Jurassic period, Cretaceous period. There's the years that it spans. Uh, the earliest dinosaurs in the Triassic you see compared to the rest on the list here, they're relatively small, uh, but they were already specialized enough to be both carnivores and also some herbivores. So they're already branching out to fill a bunch of different niches to operate with a bunch of different lifestyles, a bunch of different body plans, you see they already look fairly different from each other. Uh, by the end of the Triassic, they've gotten quite a bit bigger. They're up to nine meters long. And then you see in the Jurassic, we have truly these colossal giants. And then in the Cretaceous, we start seeing a lot of the dinosaurs that we really recognize, some of our favorites, uh, these big boys here. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that most of the dinosaurs from quote unquote Jurassic Park, uh, they're actually Cretaceous in age, so it's a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, it should probably be called Cretaceous Park. Uh, Jurassic maybe sounds better, I don't know, better to sell merchandise, but keep that in mind. Uh, so these are dinosaurs, fearfully great lizards or fearfully great reptiles, not really terrible lizards as it's usually said. So the quote unquote first dinosaur, or at least the person who coined that term was uh, Sir Richard Owen. He's credited with coining the term dinosaurs. So this was the first time that people used the word dinosaurs and applied it to these critters, these critters that you see behind me. Uh, you'll notice that these look very kind of different from our modern conception of what a dinosaur looks like. And that's gonna be one of the themes of this class is how the understanding of what these critters looked like has changed through time. And also more importantly, why based on what evidence, this is a science class. So it's not just based on opinion. We don't think they're cooler if they look a little bit less lizard-like. Uh, it's because we've, the science pointed us in that direction over time and it's still actively evolving, which is another thing we're gonna talk about. So one thing to keep in mind is that uh, Sir Richard Owen, although he coined the term dinosaurs, uh, he didn't really discover dinosaurs. They were already around. There were people that already described different dinosaurs. Uh, his contribution was that he saw the similarities in the ones that were already discovered and sort of put them in this group, the dinosauria, which is what we're going to talk about in this class. He described them as a distinct tribe of saurian reptiles, so lizard-like reptiles. Uh, I don't like dwelling on people. Uh, a lot of times we focus too much on the quote-unquote giants of the field. 
one thing I'm never going to ask you on an assessment is who coined the term dinosaurs. That's it's not something that I care about. I do care about that you know the root of the, the word dinosaurs that you know that it means like fearfully great reptiles. That that's useful information. But who's who coined it doesn't matter to me as much. And the reason behind that is there's this idea in science that we all stand on the shoulders of giants, that science progresses based on the contributions of the people that came before. And too often we focus on these major people. And I don't like focusing on that because it ignores all the other people that made these contributions. Uh, sure, he's the one that actually named the dinosauria and that's a worthwhile contribution. But there's a lot of people that were working on dinosaurs behind the scenes at this time that we don't know their names. We don't know what their contributions are and kind of attributing all of these achievements to this one person is problematic, uh, especially when the person themselves is problematic in a lot of ways. And unfortunately that tends to be true of a lot of our heroes of science. Uh, it's kind of said sometimes that people are the product of their times, but uh, even in his own time, uh, Sir Richard Owen was viewed as problematic. Uh, uh, Charles Darwin is quoted as saying that, you know, you can t tell his personality based on that he doesn't have any mentors. Nobody carried on his work. Nobody worked with him. He actively stole the work of others. Now, I'm not trying to diminish his achievements, but I am trying to say that too often we focus on people and their individual achievements when it's really a collective group effort. And a lot of times the most marginalized people are the ones that we don't ever hear their stories. They don't make it into the history books. And so this is why I try not to dwell too much on people, but I am gonna mention people sometimes. I don't expect you to remember their names, but I do kind of expect you to get kind of a general gist of how this kind of went along. So, so far the story is, he named the dinosaurs, but dinosaurs were already being worked on before this. He's the one that kind of grouped them together under the umbrella term dinosauria. That's what you need to know, that dinosaurs were lumped together. So let's look at some prior work. So when he named the dinosaurs, he lumped in these three very different animals that were already described and already discovered uh, by different people. So the first one is Megalosaurus. Uh, it was originally described by Robert Plott, and it was just this big, it was a tip of a femur, and it was originally described as a war elephant. So this was in Europe. You find a giant leg bone. Where did it come from? Uh, must be an old Roman war elephant. That's like the biggest animal that they could think of. Or maybe it's a remnant of a biblical giant, uh, a giant human femur. It was officially identified as a large lizard by William Buckland in 1824. Again, the name William Buckland, I don't necessarily care. Megalosaurus was one of the first dinosaurs to be described that, that I do care about. Uh, Iguanodon was named by Gideon Mantell. And what was kind of exciting about this is it was based on large herbivorous teeth. So Megalosaurus was a carnivore. And that kind of fit with our model for lizards and reptiles. Like they're, they're mostly like kind of carnivorous, uh, the larger ones anyway. So think like crocodiles or Komodo dragons, kind of the comparables that we sort of think about. Uh, the Siguanodon was herbivorous. So try to think of a large reptile that's herbivorous today. It wasn't really known at the time. And so this is something kind of radically different. Uh, great credit was later claimed by Owen. So again, this person <laughs> was problematic even in their own times, even judged by the standards of their day, he was problematic. So I don't want to give him too much credit, but we do need to give credit where credit's due. Uh, and then the last one is uh, Uh It was also discovered by Gideon Mantell in 1832. So again, this is like a decade before the naming of the Dinosauria. Uh, this was the most complete specimen, so this was the first time they had a, a good, decent portion of a skeleton, and you could really kind of get an idea of how this thing was put together. It wasn't just a tooth, it wasn't just a fragment, it was a nearly complete skeleton, 
and it drew a picture of an armored lizard. They sort of envisioned it as this tank-like critter uh, with the spines on its back. It turns out that they're actually side spines, similar to an ankylosaurus. Uh, we'll talk about these armored dinosaurs later on in the class, but um, this was sort of the conception at the time. So these are statues in Crystal Palace Park in London, and they're the first sculptures of dinosaurs. It was the first kind of stab at reconstructing the entire body in three dimensions of these dinosaurs that had been extinct for, they didn't know how long at the time, but certainly a long time. And again, dinosaur means uh, great, <laughs> horrible, you know, terrifying, terrible, uh, horribly great, colossal lizard, sore. That was kind of the model they had in mind, was their big lizards. And so they, they, they rendered them as such. Uh, if you've watched Jurassic Park, uh, you'll see that the thinking on these has evolved quite a bit since then. And even since Jurassic Park, the thinking has evolved on there, but um, sort of envision them as sort of slow plodding lizard, cold blooded. That's not what we think for most, if not all of the dinosaurs today. So it's just interesting how thoughts evolved over time. And that's one of the themes that this course is gonna cover. Um, so besides prior work, there was much prior work. These formal scientific studies in the 1800s were the first kind of systematic approach to it where people were publishing information and making these observations formally and sharing them formally in written form. But dinosaurs have fascinated humans for as long as humans have been around, as they do today. Why are you taking a dinosaurs class? Because dinosaurs are freaking cool. Why are dinosaurs freaking cool? Because there's these giant, ancient, long dead organisms, remnant of a previous time that we're not familiar with. There, there's this mystique about them. And even the earliest of humans, as they were walking around, they encountered these giant bones. And obviously they didn't have the terminology dinosaur or the knowledge that, ah, these must be like large reptiles. But so they started making stories about these large bones. Uh, in the Gobi Desert, we've discovered necklaces that are made from little bits of dinosaur egg that kind of had holes put in and strung together. Uh, I couldn't find a picture of the actual necklaces, but this is a dinosaur nest from the Flaming Cliffs in Mongolia and the Gobi Desert. Uh, this is an oviraptor. And one thing you'll see from this, this is a very fascinating fossil, a lot of information in here. Uh, you see these nasty claws here and you think, wow, a ferocious, terrible beast. It must be raiding this nest, trying to eat these eggs. But if you look upon closer inspection, the eggs are being cradled by the arms almost like a mother sitting on a nest. And so this is a rare example of fossilized behavior. Not only are the hard parts preserved, the bones, the claws, the eggshells, the eggs themselves, the behavior of tending a nest and active parenting is preserved here. And so this is a very fascinating fossil. And this is gonna be some of the stuff that we look through throughout the semester is not just what the bones are telling us about the form, but what the record is telling us about the behavior, about the lifestyle. How did they live? What did they do? What did they eat? What was around them? What was life like back in the Mesozoic when dinosaurs walked to the earth? Uh, in Brazil, there are dinosaur track sites that are marked with pictographs or even petroglyphs. And so this is an active dinosaur trackway. You see the footprints here, and then you see these petroglyphs associated with it. Again, the artists are not around to tell their story, but obviously this was done with intention. Why would you put these petroglyphs near these dinosaur tracks? They obviously assign some importance to them. Specifically, what importance? We don't know. But they thought it was important enough to make a design there. They saw the footprints. They knew that these were special and unique. Maybe not the whole story behind them, but they knew this was different. Native Americans collected dinosaur bones. So a lot of the famous uh, out west areas where we find dinosaurs today are on Native American lands. Uh, they collected the bones. And in a lot of cases, they revered them as the grandfather of the buffalo, which really isn't too far off, right? So they knew that it was older than the buffalo because they didn't see anything 
that was this size around, but they were like, hmm, what's the biggest animal that we see? The buffalo. This must be like the forebearers of the buffalo. Things were bigger in the past. And that's part of the story. So they're on there. There's also like the legend of the Thunderbird. Again, probably related to dinosaur to encountering dinosaur fossils in the field and trying to figure out what they are. They're not human. They're not any animal that we see alive today. What could they possibly be? And it built up this whole mythos around dinosaurs, dinosaur bones. Another very interesting idea that's tackled in the first fossil hunters, uh, Adrian Mayer wrote this book a while ago. It's a very fascinating book. Uh, it's pretty speculative, uh, but it, it's an interesting read nonetheless. So the dragon myth, so our dinosaurs, the roots of not just dragons, but all like a lot of mythical creatures like griffins, uh, lots of other critters that are in myth, is there a seed of truth to these myths? So one thing that's very interesting about the dragon in particular is that the drag, the idea of a dragon or something that very strongly resembles a dragon arose multiple different times in multiple different places spread widely throughout the world. It evolved in Asia, it evolved in South America, it evolved basically in North America, it evolved in Europe. Uh, this is a uh, kind of typical Chinese dragon. This is sort of a Central American Quetzalcoatl dragon. This is sort of the standard like fantastic fantasy European dragon. This is a um, Babylonian dragon, Tiamat, and you see they kind of share a lot of creature, uh, a lot of similarities. So are they based on observations of dinosaur bones? Is that why they look so similar? Because they're all based on very similar creatures. Uh, another interpretation is that they're just sort of this amalgamation of all the fears of early humanity. So uh, think about if you're on the plains of Africa as a early hominid ancestor, Things you have to be worried about are from the sky, birds, uh, big raptors, not so much for adults, but for babies, they're a very big danger. The serpent is a big danger. And then big cats are another big danger. And what you'll notice is that the dragon is kind of a hybrid of all of these kind of mashed together into this like monstrous nightmare. So back when we feared everything, the whatever went bump in the night, because we were we were out in the in the woods. <laughs> we're out in out in the wild what's out there, the unknown, what is out there? We sort of made these stories. Uh, obviously today we have more knowledge of the natural world and what's out there, but uh, even today there, there are still stories of cryptozoids, uh, all you know, likely probably not true, but we can't rule them out necessarily. Um, where's the evidence? But it's fun to think about. And it sort of fills in this gap, this mystery, this unknown, this kind of scary unknown. What, what's, what is it that's going bump in the night there? I see these massive bones in the ground. What, what, where did it come from? Uh, so that leads us into kind of like the early foundations of this. Just humans were making observations about dinosaurs long before they knew what they were and making up stories to try to explain them. And now today we have a system of doing that and it's the science of it. So one thing to keep in mind, we're gonna be talking about paleontology uh, it's different from archaeology. So there's a very big difference between archaeology and paleontology, and a lot of people kind of get that confused. So let's kill that right away. Uh, so archaeology is the study of human history, uh, really prehistory, and it's done with a lot of digging. Uh, so excavating, in some cases, painstakingly slowly. Uh, you see here there's a grid marked out so that they can kind of remove layer by layer document exactly where all the artifacts were, exactly where any bone fragments were, and sort of put them in a larger context of the deposit. And we'll talk a little bit more about why later on in the course, but the context is important. Uh, they examine that, they examine any artifacts that they find, trying to reconstruct human history and prehistory. It's a branch of anthropology, which is studying human culture. Archaeology is all about humans. Paleontology is about the study of ancient life, and in some cases, ancient human ancestors. Uh, but it's via analysis of the fossil record and the rock record. Uh, unlike archaeology, which is a branch of anthropology, paleontology is a branch of geology and biology. 
it's kind of where those two meet, where we're talking about life uh, in the past, in the rocks. And so it's kind of like the gray area between geology and biology. That's one of the things that I find most fascinating about it is as a geologist, you're able to kind of dabble a little bit uh, into the life science, into the evolutionary aspects, into the extinction aspects, things that we examine and we see in the rock record, but you get to examine it from kind of a different angle. Uh, in pop culture, uh, archaeology is sometimes portrayed as like the Indiana Jones, the Lara Croft, uh, a lot more guns and running around and Nazi fighting. Uh, it really, it's a lot of digging. It's a lot of slow, painstaking work, systematic, uh, not necessarily boring, but it's not that. It's not the adventuring side. Uh, with paleontology, we get Jurassic Park representations. It's nothing like that. Uh, you're not dealing with the live animals, obviously. You're dealing with the remnants. Uh, this is a rather fantastical dinosaur dig. In my experience, dinosaur digs is looking for very small bone fragments and picking them off the ground and like, is this a rock or is this a part of a bone? And uh, I've never seen anything even remotely like this, which is I'd like to someday. Uh, but this is a pretty fantastic dinosaur dig. Uh, but even still, it, it, it's not the swashbuckling through dinosaur infested forests. It's reading the rock record, carefully documenting what you're finding and placing it in the context of the geology around it and the biology of the creature. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about paleontology. So I am a paleontologist slash stratigrapher. So I work with rock strata, rock layers, and also fossils. I am not a vertebrate paleontologist. I am an invertebrate paleontologist. So one thing when I say that I'm a paleontologist, people go, oh, cool, dinosaurs. I'm like, okay, yeah, I mean, I like dinosaurs. I'm interested in dinosaurs. I've been on one dinosaur dig in my life. I don't study dinosaurs in depth. Like I said, if this was a graduate school course on dinosaurs and vertebrate paleontology, I am not the one to teach that class, but this intro level natural science gen ed, uh, I have that level of ability. Uh, I am an invertebrate paleontologist, which means I study organisms without a spinal column. They don't have vertebrae. Uh, things like microplankton. A lot of paleontologists study microscopic plankton. Why? Because they form the basis of the food chain. There's a lot of them, and they're used for restricting times in the geologic record. They're very important. A lot of the oil and gas industry relies on them for age dating and correlations, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the course. <clears throat> things like trilobites, things like ammonites, invertebrates, uh, the other branch is vertebrate paleontology, study of the chordata, animals that have spinal columns or something closely approximating a spinal column anyways. Uh, this includes hominins, us, uh, mammals, fish, amphibians, reptiles, and yes, the dinosaurs. Uh, when I was at University of Buffalo, our vertebrate paleontologist studied Miocene mice rodents, and he was looking at teeth. He was going out to Kansas and he was digging and he was looking at teeth. A lot of vertebrate paleontology is fairly recent and it involves a lot of looking at teeth. Uh, teeth are very hard, teeth are very resilient. They show up a lot in the fossil record, whereas the bones in a lot of cases break down except for some of the more rigid bones like say a jaw or uh, a lot of the harder bones, which we'll talk about when we get to fossilization. Um, but even vertebrate paleontologists, most of them don't study dinosaurs. So when you encounter a paleontologist, it's, it's quite likely they do not study dinosaurs. So who does study dinosaurs? What does dinosaurs look like? Uh, so one thing to keep in mind is that the story of dinosaurs and their evolution is continuously evolving the science of dinosaurs is evolving. It's changing over time. One thing that people get confused about with science is that they get stuck in this trap of that science is all of the knowledge of humanity. And so science is this thing. It's like an encyclopedia. You go look up all the things that science knows. That's not what science is. If it was what science was, it wouldn't work. So one common way to kind of poke holes in science is that, well, scientists used to think that the earth was flat or that the uh, sun revolved around the earth. 
that was the common consensus at the time. And actually, even that's somewhat debatable. But that was eventually proven wrong. And so if all the knowledge of humanity was proven wrong, then science is just garbage. Science is not the knowledge of humanity. It's the process by which we arrive at that knowledge. Science is the process that corrected those misinterpretations over time. Science is the process by which we look at the data, we look at the evidence, and we make guesses about how things work, hypotheses, and then we test those. If they work, we keep them until something better comes along. If they don't, we reject it, we throw it out, and we try something different. Science is never finished. We never know anything. A lot of what I say in this class, and be prepared for this, a lot of what I say in this class is eventually going to be proven wrong and replaced by knowledge that is better. When I was taking a class similar to this 20 years ago, the professor was telling me a very different view of what dinosaurs were like from the view that we have today, because this process of science never stops. We are constantly looking at our evaluations, reinterpreting them, and trying to get better at it. We never get to truth, but we get towards a better truth, a closer approximation of the truth. Over time, incrementally, things get better, but they're never perfect. We never get to perfect knowledge. We never will. Science is not ever done. We keep moving forward. We keep reinterpreting. We keep seeing things that we didn't see before. And so keep that in mind. Science is a process. If you take nothing away from this class, science is a process. Think about the coronavirus. Early on, we were told, you know, don't wear masks. We don't need to wear masks. Why? Because they didn't know about asymptomatic transmission. We reevaluated the data. Hmm. Asymptomatic trans transmission is a very big problem. People that don't have symptoms are able to transmit, and wearing a mask stops that. They revise the recommendations. And obviously, people see it as flip flopping and going back and forth like, oh, they don't even know. Or you think about like surgeon general warnings like, eggs are good for you, eggs are bad for you, eggs are good for you, eggs are bad for you. Which is it? Why do they keep going back and forth? New evidence comes out. The consensus changes and shifts. It's challenged by others. That's a key is that scientists do not sit around just agreeing with each other. If you ever go to a scientific conference, there is no way that that's what's happening. People are vehemently disagreeing with each other and trying to be proven right. They want to be like, this is the way it is, and you're wrong, and this is why. And then they say, no, I'm right, because this is why. And there is a conversation. And ultimately, the data wins. The best interpretation wins for now until that's later challenged by something else. So if we look at in the context of dinosaurs, here's research year. Uh, remember here, dinosaurs were just getting started. Over time, kind of this gradual slope. And then within the last couple decades, just this massive spike. The total number of dinosaurs identified today, we're sort of in this golden age of dinosaur paleontology. Din more dinosaurs are being described today than ever before. The rate of dinosaur discoveries is following along the same kind of trail. It's changing very, very quickly. And so that's one thing to keep in mind with this class. A lot of information, I might even be telling you information that's already outdated and I, don't, I just don't know it yet. But the process of science over time will correct that. Maybe not me personally, <laughs> due to my own personal flaws, but uh, I'm always researching this. I'm always looking at what the new latest interpretations are and sort of weighing, like, is this really what's happening? What did the data say? And kind of changing over time towards a better truth, towards a better approximation of the truth. OK, so that's kind of a nutshell about dinosaur science. And uh, let's get back to the topic of what is a dinosaur by what is not a dinosaur. So uh, this is going to be painful for some of you, so, so I hope you're sitting down. Uh, there are many creatures that people think are dinosaurs that are not dinosaurs. Unfortunately, this includes some of our favorites, uh, some of my personal favorites growing up as a kid. Uh, not all big critters, big ancient critters, are dinosaurs. Not all large Mesozoic critters are dinosaurs. Not all large reptiles are dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are a very specific type of reptile. So look at these things 
uh, they all kind of look like dinosaurs. They're not. Why not? Let's talk about it. So this is a Dimetrodon. Uh, if you buy dinosaur toys, a lot of times Dimetrodon comes in there. Uh, Dimetrodon is not only not a dinosaur, it's not even from the Mesozoic. Dimetrodon is from the Permian. It predates the Mesozoic. Dimetrodons are actually closer related to mammals, us, than they are to dinosaurs. Dimetrodons are synapsids. They're on a different evolutionary branch entirely than dinosaurs are. They're not dinosaurs. Meh. Survey says wrong. Uh, moving along, uh, one of the favorites from Jurassic Park, the Mosasaur, uh, nowhere near as big as portrayed in, I think it's Jurassic World, where it jumps out of the tank and snaps up the great, great white. Uh, Mosasaur is not a dinosaur. It's not, it's a marine reptile. Uh, why it's not a dinosaur, we'll talk about a little bit in depth later, but it's not a dinosaur. It's not a specific type of reptile. It doesn't meet the definition of a dinosaur. A uh, heron, so this is a baby blue heron. It's a modern animal. Well, dinosaurs are extinct, so obviously this isn't a dinosaur. Oh, what? Uh, it's a dinosaur, uh, at least in the loosest terms. Uh, birds are ancestors of a certain branch of the dinosaur lineage. Birds are dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, uh, that's why sometimes we separate them into the non-avian dinosaurs, the not bird dinosaurs, those are all extinct. The avian dinosaurs, the lineage that went on to become the birds, are not extinct. They live on in the form of birds. Birds are evolutionarily related to dinosaurs. All right, here's another one of the favorites, plesiosaur, the long-necked marine dinosaur. Oh, wait, it's not a dinosaur. It's a marine reptile. Oh my god, okay, so surely everyone's favorite T-Rex must be a dinosaur, and obviously it, it is. It's one of the most famous dinosaurs. Uh, another one of people's favorites, I think I'm gonna see a lot of this in the discussion board about people's favorite dinosaur being pterodactyls or pterosaurs. Uh, they are not dinosaurs, they are flying reptiles. So hopefully you're not too crestfallen about that. So why, why are they not dinosaurs? Well, let's look at the evolutionary history of dinosaurs. So let's go to the dinosaur ancestors. And we'll talk more about this later on in the semester, but for now, I just wanna show you this. So the earliest dinosaur ancestors are the basal, they're called archosaurs, or sometimes referred to as stem reptiles. They're the forebearers of reptiles. Uh, they originated in the late Paleozoic in kind of the Permian era. Small, agile reptiles with long tails, short forelimbs. This is an example here. It looks very much like a dinosaur, right? Uh, a lot of them were bipedal, means they walked on two legs, so frees up the front hands, arms for activities. Uh, they used their forelimbs for like catching prey. Uh, later, it evolved into wings uh, for flight. Uh, subsequently, the crocodilians uh, reverted back to the four-footed stance, so they ended up kind of going back that way. But if we look at, so these are the stem reptiles, there's a branch that goes off this way, the synapsids. This is where Dimetrodon was. Dimetrodon is one of these, the forebears of the mammals. This branch is where we came from. Uh, synapsids, all this is kind of determined by skull morphology. Synapsids have one hole in their skull. Uh, humans, we don't think about, we have holes in our heads. So there's our eye sockets, uh, but there's also holes behind our cheekbones where there's this large muscle that attaches to bah, 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 power our jaw. Bah, 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 bah. Uh, there's holes in our heads, one hole that we're synapsids. Related evolutionary, all the animals on this branch have that one hole in their heads. Turtles and apsids have no holes in their heads, so that's a separate branch. Uh, then there's the diapsids, they have two holes in their heads. First, let's talk about the ones that, that, that have, uh, so one hole, the uriapsids, uh, one hole, but it's elevated up higher. Uh, that's the ichthyosaurs and the plesiosaurs. That's why they're not dinosaurs. They're on this separate branch. Uh, they don't have the two hole skull like the rest of dinosaurs do. They're different. They are a type of reptile that moved into the sea. Uh, so, well, why are not, why are pterosaurs not on here? Well, pterosaurs, archosaurs, 
crocodilians branch off here, pterosaurs branch off here. It's not until here that we get the dinosaurs. So pterosaurs are close, more closely related to the dinosaurs, but they're not themselves dinosaurs. They're a type of flying reptile because they're not on this evolutionary path of the dinosaurs, but you'll notice that birds are. So this branch is the dinosaurs. Everything on this evolutionary path are dinosaurs and everything that's not is not. Snakes are not dinosaurs. They're on this path. Lizards are not dinosaurs. In many ways, they sort of loosely resemble dinosaurs, but that's an example of convergent evolution, which we'll talk about later in the course. This thing kind of looks like a dinosaur too, but it's warm-blooded. It might have had fur. It's uh, very close to a mammal. It's the forebears of mammals. Uh, it's not a dinosaur. Uh, so keep that in mind. So, uh, But that doesn't mean we're not going to talk about it. So the marine reptiles, bear in mind that the marine reptiles, the ichthyosaurs, the plesiosaurs, the mosasaurs, they end in soar. So must be a dinosaur, right? If they're not. They're marine reptiles. They branched off from a common land ancestor back in the Permian. They're not even really all that closely related to dinosaurs. Uh, one thing you'll notice here, again, an example of convergent evolution is that these things very much resemble whales and dolphins of the modern time. Marine reptiles went into the sea and they evolved into efficient forms for being in the sea. And those efficient forms for being in the sea happen to independently look like the forms that today mammals take to be efficient in the sea. This is an example of convergent evolution, similar forms emerging separately through common processes. Uh, they are not dinosaurs, they're marine reptiles. So all of these organisms here are marine reptiles, not dinosaurs. We will talk about them though. So there's gonna be a whole day devoted to marine reptiles and flying reptiles. Pterosaurs are also not dinosaurs. Uh, they're a little bit more closely related to dinosaurs. Uh, there's two groups, the, uh, oh, I hate this word, <laughs> Ramphorinchoids, I think is how you say it, and the more well-known pterodactyls. So when you think of pterosaurs, you think of pterodactyls, flying reptiles. Uh, the earliest ones, when they were first starting to evolve towards the wing, uh, they didn't have a fully developed wing for flapping. They probably just used it for gliding. Uh, one common criticism of evolution is how useful is half an eye? How useful is half of a wing? How useful is half of an arm? Uh, the answer is it's more useful than no wing or no eye. Uh, something that senses light but doesn't have full developed vision like we think of it is better than nothing. Something that allows you to kind of glide and extend your leap is better than nothing. Uh, later on, it evolved into flapping flyers. There's a bit of debate about how wings actually attached. We'll talk about all that later. Uh, but just keep in mind, flying reptiles are, are not dinosaurs. So what is a dinosaur? What separates dinosaurs from the rest of the reptiles? So dinosaurs are different from other reptiles in a few distinct ways. One is their hip structure. So other reptiles tend to have this kind of sprawling out to the sides. Think about a crocodile. Uh, dinosaurs do not have that. They have a more erect stance. Uh, also, their femur head, the head of the long bone in the leg, takes a 90 degree angle. Why? Because it goes into the hip socket and it sort of comes out to allow it to go straight down for a more upright stance compared to not at an angle, they have to sprawl out to the side. Uh, the ankle structure, the first row of ankle bones is fused to the tibia. Down here at the ankle, the bones fused. Uh, if you look at the limbs, the radius and the ulna versus the humerus. So the two lower arm bones are longer than they are in other reptiles, making kind of more gracile, more elongate, more delicate looking limbs. Uh, and then another key difference is that the sacrum, the hip vertebrae are fused in dinosaurs at the hip. There's at least three fused vertebrae at the hip, uh, probably to support the weight versus reptiles that only generally only have two. Uh, so those are the big differences between dinosaurs and reptiles. All dinosaurs have these or evolved away from it separately. Uh, so let's talk about dinosaur evolution. And this is gonna be how modules uh, three and four are structured is we're gonna talk about the Saurischia, the lizard hipped dinosaurs. Saur means lizard, ischia means hipped. 
Ornithisha, ornith means bird. And again, Thisha hip, Ornithisha, the bird hipped dinosaurs. So there's two kind of big branches. Here's all of dinosaurs. There's this branch here, the Saurisha. There's this branch here, the Ornithisha. One thing that's very confusing and super unfortunate is that you'll see that birds are not bird hipped dinosaurs. Birds evolved over here on the Saurischian side. They independently later evolved back to that bird-like hip. Uh, all the rest of the Saurischians do not have that. Uh, and you'll see here the example here, the pubis bone sticks out towards the front. In bird-like dinosaurs, it sticks out to the back, uh, probably to allow for more expanded lung capacity. Uh, but anyway, uh, also they have beaks. Birds have beaks, but they're not ornithischian dinosaurs. The beak evolved again later separately, and we'll talk about all this in detail later. But just there's two main dinosaur orders, the Saurischians, lizard-hipped, and ornithischians, bird-hipped, and those are two entire different modules later on in the course. Uh, this is an example of how they're further split into clad. So the, all of dinosaurs, again, ornithischian bird-hipped, saurischian lizard-hipped, the ornithischian bird hipped split off into the seropoda. Uh, I don't expect you to remember the scientific names. I do kind of expect you to remember the significance of them. So seropoda means horned foot. Thyreophora are the shield bearers, stegosaurs, and chylosaurs. Pachycephalosaurs, pachy means thick. Cephalon is head. Saur is, again, lizard, thick-headed lizard. Ornithopoda, pod is foot, bird footed. Ceratopsia, horn faced. Here's a ceratopsia in the triceratops. Here's a bird footed, the duck billed dinosaur, hadrosaur. Here's a pachycephalosaur, you see the thick head. Here's a stegosaur, the plated armored dinosaur. Here's an ankylosaur, the tank like armored dinosaur. These are the ornithicians that we'll talk about, the major groups of the ornithicians. The saurischians are the sauropod, the lizard footed the big boys, the big herbivorous dinosaurs, and the theropods, the beast-like, beast-footed dinosaurs that eventually evolve into tyrannosaurs and ultimately into birds. The birds are theropods, they're a branch of the theropod dinosaurs. So this is how we branch off here. Uh, we often think about dinosaurs as sort of far away from us, uh, only out west. There are dinosaur remains in New York State. Most of New York State is Paleozoic rocks that are older than dinosaurs. That's one of the reasons why I am an invertebrate paleontologist. I study bryozoans, study trilobites, study crinoids, study brachiopods, invertebrate fossils from the Paleozoic, because that's what's in most of New York's rocks. Most of New York is covered with sedimentary rocks that are older than dinosaurs, with organisms that are older than dinosaurs. But if you go down towards the city in the Newark Graben, uh, there are dinosaur tracks in New York State. And Coelophysis is New York's official state dinosaur. It has kind of this elongate head, a really slender body, probably possibly a pack hunter. Uh, there's some debate about how feathered or not it is. We'll have lots of talks about that, whether the, a given dinosaur is feathered or not. Uh, in this case, it likely was. And this is kind of a relative sized human to start state dinosaur. Uh, and then the last thing that I want to talk about today is remember that dinosaurs are not truly extinct. Birds are sort of a modern expression of dinosaurs. Uh, unlike all of the other dinosaurs, the avian dinosaurs made it through that Cretaceous Paleogene extinction. We'll talk all about that at the end of the class. But if you look really closely at their skeletal makeup, you can kind of see why. Birds and dinosaurs have a lot of similarities in their morphology, in their anatomy, in their shapes because of their shared evolutionary lineage. So this is a pigeon skeleton, a bird. Uh, this is an Archaeopteryx. Uh, Archaeopteryx is sort of the transition. It's a bird-like dinosaur. And then this is a terrestrial dinosaur, one of the earlier forms along this line. Uh, you'll notice a lot of similarities, a lot of things that are very common. That baby heron looked a lot like a baby dinosaur, because in many ways it is. Uh, this is a reconstruction of what Archaeopteryx probably kind of looked like. Uh, I think there's new evidence that the feathers were probably actually black. 
based on chemistry. Uh, this is the famous Archaeopteryx fossil from the Solenhofen limestone in Germany. Uh, it actually preserves the feather structures. Archaeopteryx is definitively feathered. And feathers are really hard to observe in the fossil record. We'll talk about why later, but there's a big debate about did dinosaurs have feathers? T-Rex in particular, people have sort of gone back and forth on. T-Rex is on the lineage that eventually leads towards the birds. It's a theropod. Birds arose from that lineage. Was T-Rex covered in feathers? Uh, I tend to think not, and we'll explain why later, but maybe. There's no real strict evidence of it. There is some preserved skin that seems to imply that it wasn't, but we'll talk about all that evidence later on. But uh, one of the big debates is how feathered dinosaurs were. And uh, that's all we've got for today. So here's just the normal disclaimer about the video and the copyrights and everything. I hope you enjoyed that lesson. Again, follow along on discussion board. If you have any questions, post on discussion board, come to office hours. All I have for today, thank you and goodbye.